Nepal and India have shared a friendship that goes back decades. During this period, the two nations have shared support for one another, but there were plenty of issues of contention as well. Today, the two countries have signed an agreement for power trade, which has been welcomed by all quarters, but the terms of the trade and the implementation could still be in question for the time being. Good evening, I'm Sarah Sapsanama. Let's begin with the headlines of the hour. Nepal and India signed long-term energy trade agreement. Nepal to export 10,000 megawatts of electricity in the next 10 years, private sector infused. Ruling coalition prepared to share six seats at the National Assembly with main opposition CPN UMO on the condition for its support in the transitional justice bill. Japanese 14 killed in Israeli bombing of a house in Khan Yunis. Tension escalates as Israeli attacks kill nine Hezbollah members in the Lebanese border. And Cricket Association of Nepal can releases its calendar for 2024, including 34 international tournaments. Men's cricket team to play three League Two series. Nepal and India have locked a long-term agreement for power trade today as energy secretaries from both the sides signed the agreement at the Ministry of Energy, Water Resources and Irrigation. The agreement was signed by Energy Secretary for Nepal, Gopal Sikdil, and his Indian counterpart, Pankaj Agrawal. With this, Nepal is set to export 10,000 megawatts of electricity to India in the next 10 years. Earlier in June last year, Prime Minister Pushpa Kamal Dahal had struck an agreement with his Indian counterpart for the same during his four-day state visit to India. Now, with the agreement inked, various government and private companies will sign different periodic agreements to buy electricity from Nepal. The private sectors in both the countries are also allowed to export and import electricity. The Nepal government has prepared an energy strategy with the aim of producing 20,000 megawatts of electricity in the next 12 years. 13,000 of this will be used for domestic consumption and 15,000 for export to countries including India. During the Nepal-India Joint Commission meeting today, foreign ministers of both the countries also inaugurated three transmission lines of 132 kVA. The ruling alliance seems prepared to share six seats from the National Assembly with main opposition CPNUML, but with a condition. The coalition is ready to share seats if the main opposition supports it with the Transitional Justice Bill, which is in consideration at the Parliamentary Committee. The meeting held today at Prime Minister's official residence in Balwatar had dwelt on the possibility of joining hands with the opposition as the National Assembly election nears. Meanwhile, CPNUML has claimed it has not sought for share in the upper house election despite holding discussion for collaboration. UML Deputy General Secretary Pradeep Gewali clarified that inter-party discussions were natural and that his party did not demand for its share. India's Minister for External Affairs S. Jay Shankar, who has arrived in Nepal on a two-day visit, paid courtesy call on Prime Minister Pushpa Kamal Dahal and President Ram Chandra Podel. The visiting Indian minister, who had arrived through an international airport at 9.45 a.m. this morning, reached Sital Niwas at 11 a.m. to pay his courtesy call to President Ram Chandra Podil. The office of the president said that the courtesy meeting had lasted for 20 minutes. Following the meeting with the president, Indian, Prime, Indian minister Jay Shankar had reached Singadarwar to pay his courtesy call on Prime Minister Pushpa Kamal Dahal. The Prime Minister's advisor for external affairs, Rupak Sapkota, said that the meeting dwelt on mutual benefit and bilateral relations. And moving on, detainee Kamal Khadka, who had escaped with handcuffs from the premises of Kathmandu District Court yesterday, has been arrested from the capital's Jadibuti. Police have said that Kharka had been detained from New Dolakhali Guest House in Jadibuti of Kathmandu Metropolis 32. Police further said that the handcuffs and his prison uniform had been recovered from his room in Duakot of Changunaran Municipality 1, Bhaktapur. Kharka, who was taken to the Kathmandu District Court yesterday for a detention hearing, had absconded from the court premises. 32-year-old Kharka, who is a local resident of Barabisi in Sindhu Palchog, had been taken to the court by Maharajganj Police Circle. He had managed to evade all the security barriers at the court premises and escaped during the process of detention hearing. The meeting of the Bagmati Provincial Assembly has not been held since 9th of October. The Provincial Assembly has remained without business as the province government has yet to call for the winter session. 
Members of the Provincial Assembly had taken the oath of office and secrecy on 29th of December 2022, while the first meeting of the Province Assembly was held on 2nd of January last year. A total of eight bills, including the financial bill, was endorsed by 56 meetings of the Provincial Assembly during this period. Meanwhile, the province governor had returned the provincial lottery bill, citing need for review. Saligram Jamakatel, who had become chief minister of Bagmati province with the support of main opposition CPN UMO, garnered the vote of confidence for the second time. The chief minister has not been able to call the winter session of the provincial assembly due to failure in implementing the agreement reached with the main opposition during budget endorsement. There are five parliamentary committees in the Bagmati Provincial Assembly and these committees are being led by the senior most members amid failure in making the appointments. Meanwhile, the province government has been criticized for making ploy to avoid the winter session as the senior most members of the committees are from the ruling alliance. And moving on, tensions have heightened between Kathmandu Medical College administrations and residential doctors. Tensions between the residential doctors and the hospital administration has intensified after the hospital suspended Dr. Vishad Dahal, saying that he had expressed reservations in participating in health camps. The doctors have been staging protests, demanding to reinstate Dahal without conditions. Meanwhile, the KMC administration has maintained that all resident doctors must abide by the regulation and contribute in health camps. Negotiations were held between the hospital administration and the doctors in two phases earlier today. However, a consensus could not be reached. It's time now for our segment, Public Pulse, where you text us with your opinion. The question is, what do you think of a detailed escaping from court premises? Your options are a witness on part of the police, b security in question, and c possibility of a nexus. The voting is on. Type NEWS, select your option A, B, or C. Want to share your opinion with us. 32 passengers, including the driver, have been injured in a bus accident in Tonahu. The ill-fated bus that was headed to Pokhara from Birganj met with the unfortunate accident at Tulo Pohiro in Tanahu. Police have said that the driver lost control of the vehicle, which had plunged around 65 feet below the road section, injuring 32 passengers, including the driver himself. One injured individual is in a critical condition. Eight individuals are being treated at Manipal Hospital in Pokhara, while the remaining others are being treated at Bill Chaudhara. Let's move on to international update. At least 14 people have been killed and a number of people injured in an Israeli bombing of a house belonging to Salah family west of Khan Yunis. Elsewhere, nine Hezbollah members were killed in Israeli strikes amid Lebanese border clashes. Hezbollah leader Nasrallah has said his fighters are not afraid of war but has avoided any declaration that his forces would escalate attacks after the killing of Saleh al-Aruri. At least 22,313 people have been killed and 57,296 wounded in Israeli attacks on Gaza since October 7. The revised death toll from the October 7 attack on Israel stands at 1,139. Israeli embassies around the world have been reportedly put on alert following the Tuesday assassination of Hamas Deputy Chief Saleh al-Aruri in Lebanon. The Israeli public broadcaster KAN said, Air Force and forces stationed on the border with Lebanon were also asked to increase vigilance amid retaliation threats by Hamas and Hezbollah. Meanwhile, political and war analysts say Hamas leader Saleh al-Aruri's assassination in Lebanon has opened Pandora's box. In another context, the coalition of Israeli lawmakers is trying to hamstring the UN agency for Palestinian refugees, UNRWA, claiming it is a tool of Hamas. UNRWA is the largest aid agency operating in the besieged Gaza Strip, where an estimated 1.9 million displaced Palestinians are in desperate need of food, shelter and medicine. The U.S. Secretary of State is scheduled for another visit to the region, including a stop in Israel. This will be Antony Blinken's fourth tour of the Middle East since the Gaza war broke out as the U.S. struggles to balance a string of Arab alliances angered by Washington's all-out backing of Israel during the conflict. The UN Security Council held an open meeting yesterday on the Houthi forces attack in the Red Sea, with member states calling for an end to maritime attacks and expressing grave concern about the negative impact on global food security. 
According to United Nations, there have been 24 attacks on international ships traveling through the Red Sea since mid-November. Last month, the Houthi military group said that ending its naval operations is contingent on Israel ending its siege of Gaza. Several shipping companies have already moved to reroute their ships around South Africa to reduce the risks. But this adds some additional 10 days of travel and negatively impacts upon international trade and freight costs, according to International Maritime Organization. During yesterday's opening meeting, UN Assistant Secretary General Khalid Khiari told the Council that no cause or grievance events could justify continuing Houthi attacks against freedom of navigation in the Red Sea, adding that all incidents originating in Houthi-controlled areas must stop. The United Kingdom, together with other states, warned against further attacks, saying they are a direct threat to the freedom of navigation, which is protected by international law. China has also called for an end to the attacks and said the root cause of the attacks must be addressed. It said the tensions in the Red Sea have posed new challenges to political process in Yemen and brought additional complexity to the already volatile Middle East region. Prime Minister of Japan Fumio Kishida said that rescue efforts in Japan have been stepped up as the end of a crucial 72-hour survival window neared for the New Year's quake, which has left at least 77 people dead. According to emergency responders, survival rates drop off 72 hours after the quake. Kishida said a large number of people were believed to be still trapped beneath rubble and everything was being done to reach as many people as possible. The number of self-defense force personnel working in the affected areas of central Japan's Ishikawa prefecture could more than double to 4,600 people over the course of January 4 to help with the rescue and relief work, he said, as survivors and media reports showed shortages of basic supplies, including water. Severed roads and the remote location of the worst hit areas have complicated rescue efforts. Nearly 600 tremors have hit the Noto Peninsula since the main earthquake. Beijing has said earlier today that it strongly deplores the landing of stray artillery shells from across the border with Myanmar that have hurt people within China. Chinese Foreign Ministry spokesperson Wang Wenbin said at a regular news briefing, Beijing had protested to Myanmar, adding that China would take the necessary steps to safeguard the lives and property of its citizens. Five people in a Chinese town near Myanmar were wounded yesterday by stray artillery shells from across the border, according to China's state-controlled Global Times, as fighting between Myanmar's junta and rebels persisted despite talks. Armed conflict has surged in Myanmar's north between the military and rebel groups since late October, spurring calls for ceasefire from neighboring China, which has even facilitated dialogue between the two sides. And more international news, North Korea is shaking up the way it handles relations with South Korea, enacting changes to policy and government organizations that would effectively treat the South as a separate enemy state, experts have said. The moves which break the decades of policy could see the North's foreign ministry taking over relations with the South to potentially help justify the use of nuclear weapons against Seoul in a future war. In remarks to a 2023 year-end party meeting, North Korean leader Kim Jong-un said peaceful reunification is impossible and that the government would make a decisive policy change in relations with the enemy, state news agency KCNA reported. He also ordered the military to be prepared to pacify and occupy the South in the event of a crisis. Since the 1950-53 Korean War ended in a stalemate, both nations have had policies that treat each other differently than other countries. That has included relying on special agencies and ministries for inter-Korean relations rather than their foreign ministries and embracing policies for a future peaceful reunification, usually envisioning a single state with two systems. The Cricket Association of Nepal CAN has published its calendar for 2024, including 34 international engagements. The men's national cricket team are to play three League Two series in the year. The calendar includes all national and international events that the national team will participate in December 31st. The men's cricket team will begin its round as the Nepal, Namibia and the Netherlands series will begin on February 17th. Before the series, Nepal will play three ODIs with Canada between February 10 to 14. Two of the three League Two series will be played away from home. 
In September, Nepal will participate in League Two series with Canada in their home ground along with Namibia. In October, the national cricket team will leave for US to play with the hosts and Scotland. Likewise, Nepal will play a bilateral series with each of the League Two participants ahead of the League Two series itself. Nepal will play seven ODIs with Canada in 2024. Can will also organize the franchise Nepal T20 League between November and December later this year. The association will solely organize the league, which is also its main revenue source. The association had contracted an Indian company for the first edition of the league, which was engulfed in controversy. That is all for the moment. Thank you for watching. Bye for now.